Jesus tells a parable about the coexistence of good and evil in this world. God's judgment will remove all evildoers and causes of sin, but not until the end of history. A reading from Matthew chapter 13. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as, as well. And, and the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And the disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Sisters and brothers in faith, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you remember Joe Namath? Okay, many of you do. There's probably a few in here that are younger than me that don't remember him. Joe Namath was kind of the Tom Brady of, I don't know, what was it, 1969 or so? He was the quarterback of the New York Jets, and he led them to Super Bowl III, which was, that makes it 49 years ago. I'm, I'm getting, wow, okay. <laughs> and Super Bowl III was against the Baltimore Colts. The Colts were in Baltimore in those days, and the Ravens were the Cleveland Browns, but that's a different story. We won't go there. Anyway, in the two weeks before the Super Bowl, Joe Namath got up, and he guaranteed that the Jets would beat the Colts. Guaranteed it. And this was back when the, when the old AFL, before the AFC, it was called the AFL, no AFL team had ever won a Super Bowl. Actually, it was a time when no team but the Packers had ever won a Super Bowl, but that's a different story, too. So it was big talk. And the Colts, who were heavy favorites, licked their chops and waited for the day when they could make Namath eat his words. Except it never happened, did it? The Jets beat the Colts in a huge upset, and suddenly, suddenly that Super Bowl game was a much more interesting um, thing to have happen. In our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah, it's kind of like the run-up to Super Bowl III. You've got the heavy favorites, the Babylonians holding all the people of Israel captive, and you've got an Israelite prophet named Isaiah opening his big mouth and guaranteeing an upset victory for his people. But it gets bigger. The God of Israel was starting to talk trash. <laughs> Did you hear it in our lesson for today? He said, I am the first and the last, and besides me, there is no God. And that doesn't sound so strange to our ears, but in those days, everybody knew for sure that Marduk was the real God. Marduk, the God of Babylon, who had crushed every nation in Babylon's path, including Israel and their wimpy little God. And now he's talking trash? I mean, if you want to, it's, they kind of cleaned it up for today's church service. You know, we don't want to have that trash talking in church. If you want to read all the trash, read um, chapters 43 and 44 of Isaiah. It gets pretty good, but I'll, summar, I'll summarize what he says. First of all, God says, Israel, his beloved, 
and he's called Israel by name and redeemed her. Yeah, right. That's why Jerusalem is destroyed and the survivors are working for foreigners. And then in today's lesson, God claims that not only is Marduk weaker, Marduk doesn't even exist. Israel's God is the only God. And then Isaiah goes on to tell the story of the Babylonian craftsman who takes this block of wood and and he starts carving. And from that block of wood, he carves an idol and a spoon. And he uses the wood chips from the carving to start a fire. And then he used the spoon to eat his supper. And after supper, he looks at the little idol that he made and he bows down to it and says, you are my God. And he's laughing at him. There are no statues of Israel's God. Israel's God is the one who sent the sunshine and the rain and grew that tree that the pathetic Babylonian craftsman cut to make his fire and his spoon and his idol. Oh, I mean, this is nasty stuff. And it's pretty good trash talking too, I mean, if you can do it. Except for one little detail. God, if you love us so much, why are the Babylonians holding all the guns and all the money? Why is our country a wasteland? And why are we rotting here in a Babylonian ghetto? I mean, what what good are you, God? I got no job. I've got no home. My kids are hungry. Is that any way to treat the ones you say that you love? Turns out, having only one God is not easy. If there are lots of gods out there and they're fighting all the time, that's a little easier. You get to throw your lot in with one god or the other and hope that he or she wins and is nice to you. And it's all about picking the right horse and laying low when the wrong one is ahead. And if there's no god at all, well, that's kind of easy too. Then you just make your peace with random chance. You hope you get lucky. And when life's over, it's just over. There's no meaning to worry about. But if there's one god, then that one is responsible for everything that happens, good and bad. And if that one God claims to love you and be good, as well as all-powerful, and the world God supposedly love is a really messed up place, well, that makes it kind of complicated. But that's the claim of our Bible. There is only one behind all of existence, And the one at the center of our existence is good. And the one at the center of existence made you and loves you and will ultimately make you his own. The chaos will not win. And that's also what makes our God kind of interesting. We all have this experience that gives us really no reason to believe such a being exists. And yet every now and then, People experience them. An old man and an old woman, grandparent age, they have a baby and a family, and and then a nation is born from these three. That nation becomes enslaved by a cruel and powerful ruler, and then they are somehow freed from their oppression by an old guy and his brother-in-law. There's a shepherd boy who likes music and poetry, and he takes out a trained soldier with a slingshot, and then he becomes his nation's Abe Lincoln. And in the next 400 years, this unlikely nation of former slaves begins enslaving their own people. And the one God says, quit it or else. And they choose for some reason or else. And in come the Babylonians. And in the months and years after our lesson for today, the conquered people are freed to go back home and then rebuild their burned city. I mean, isn't that an interesting way to be God? (laughs) And there are more stories about the coming of the, about this God. A young woman becomes pregnant and through her this God walks among us as one of us. He heals and forgives and he teaches and he gets himself executed by the state. That's not something you expect from a God. And then even in agony, he is kind to his murderers. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he sends, he comes back from the grave and sends his shock friends 
to continue telling everybody the good news about this God who loves them. It's a strange way to be God. And it's certainly not the way I'd do it if I were God. I mean, if I were God, I'd go in with guns blazing and take out all those evildoers. And if I were God, it would be over really fast. (laughs) But this God seems to care more about collateral damage than winning. Isaiah says, a bent reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench. Our Lord tells his servants to let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest so that we don't damage any of the wheat. And then the angels, the angels can separate them, not us. I mean, what kind of a God is that? This Bible we read, it's not really history, it's not really biography, it's not science, it's testimony. People just like you and me who have experienced something unbelievable in their lives and they can't help but tell this story. And against every expectation, they recognize that this God is somehow at work in their lives. And these stories they tell about this merciful and powerful and gentle God help us to recognize him working in our lives too. You know the stories. We hear, we hear Peter's story. Remember him? Remember, remember how he was on fire for the Lord and remember how he tried and failed so many times? Remember how he claimed that he was going to die for Jesus if he needed to? And that very night he denies Jesus three times. I mean, talk about wheat and weeds. Why would anybody waste their time on a person with so little potential? (laughs) But Jesus did. And he let the wheat and the weeds grow together, even in Peter. And Peter grew. And he became a wise and energetic leader of our church. It's kind of like your children. You remember them, right? (laughs) Did you ever wonder sometimes Why did I have these kids? (laughs) I did. And, you know, I remember even wondering, should I let them live now that I have them? (laughs) And then they do something that makes you so proud, it brings tears to your eyes, right? And in a blink of an eye, they are grown up, young men and women full of potential and talent, And it turns out a few weeds in the wheat really isn't the end of the world after all. Hmm? Having one God is not easy, but it is good. And the Bible writers are trying to describe their experience of this one God. Certainly today's are. In Romans, Paul explores this already not yet of belonging to God. It's not easy. We're already God's children. We already cry out, Abba, Father. We're already heirs, he says. But it sure hasn't been realized in my life, has it in yours? (laughs) We live in that in-between place, Paul says, where we belong to God, but we haven't had the full experience of it yet. My previous parish worked with some orphans down in Jamaica, and every now and then, one of the orphans would be adopted. But there was always a lag time of many months, sometimes years, between the time when the child was adopted and then the time when the child was united with their family. And so this child would wait. And from the outside, it looks like she goes about life as she always has in the orphanage, but inside, inside she has a new identity, even though everything looks the same. She was nobody's child, but when she's adopted, she's somebody's child. She was poor, but when she's adopted, she becomes an heir. She was a throwaway citizen of Jamaica, but when she was adopted, she became a valued citizen of this country. And in that in-between time, she lives her life in that new reality. She lives in hope and expectation of what's going to happen. 
Our baptism is like that. We cry, Abba, Father, for this little one that we love. Make him yours. Make him an inheritor of the good things that you have to give. And no matter what happens in his life, fill him with that hope, that expectation for what comes next. We live in the already and the not yet with that same eager expectation. Our God is the only God, and that God does love us. Yet in many ways we still live in Babylon. The fields of our lives are full of golden wheat and of noxious weeds. But as Romans says, we look forward in hope to the harvest of all the good things that God is going to do. So we look forward in hope like a woman at the airport on tiptoe, straining to see the one she loved come out of the gate. We look forward in hope like a child on Christmas Eve, waiting for that first morning light and all the good things that that day is going to bring. We live in hope that this Lord really has redeemed wheat and weeds like us. We live in hope that this really is the body of Christ given for you. This really is the blood of Christ shed for you. We live in hope that this Lord really is the first and the last, the everlasting one who made us his own. Amen. Please stand for the hymn.